Look folks, if you're coming here and you're not already a fan of my videos, I'm gonna level with you. I am a full-on, card-carrying SJW. Why won't you just shut up? You know the ones that have to read political statements into everything they watch and talk about how this thing you liked as a kid is problematic for some reason? That's me. You ever get recommended that video about how the movie Sky High is actually fascist? Yep. That's me. Uh -oh. So trust me, if anyone was going to do a big hot take about how Joker is secretly an incel red pill alt-right propaganda movie, it's gonna be me. And I'm here to tell you, this movie... I really liked it. You know what else I really like? Today's sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends. Raid Shadow Legends ain't your grandma's mobile game. One of the most ambitious RPG projects of 2019, Raid boasts far more than you'd expect for a simple phone game. With an amazing storyline, awesome 3D graphics, giant boss fights, PvP battles, and hundreds of champions to collect and customize. Over 10 million players worldwide have signed up to join in the fun in just the first six months. And the best part? It's free. On top of this deep and engaging gameplay that can really only be compared with the biggest PC and console titles, the game offers you the ability to personally customize your champions, choosing their artifacts and creating a unique mastery build for each one of them. You can pretty up your guy however you like, which sounds pretty neat to me. The game also just launched a much anticipated Faction Wars feature, so now's a good time to hop on in, and if you want to do so, make sure to use these special links down in the description for a free epic champion and 50,000 silver to do with as you please. Once you're signed in you get a new daily login reward for the first 90 days, whether you want to sink in a few hours or just throw it on for a few minutes. Over 300,000 reviewers have already earned Raid Shadow Legends a near 5 star rating, and you could be one of them. Also, quick disclaimer, this video is going to use the word society repeatedly. I'm not going to make a joke about it. I already made a joke about it in a previous video. I'm kind of sick of the joke. I wish we could stop making it. Now, to get some things out of the way before I move on, it should be obvious to anyone who's seen Joker that it resists easy and straightforward answers about who it's for or what it's really trying to say. Even beyond questions of what elements of the film are even real and not the wild fantasies of its lead character, it's a film that isn't particularly interested in signposting any correct message to take away from it, instead giving us a series of both sympathetic and horrifying vignettes, painting the picture of a man and the culture he's a part of being driven to the absolute Brink. Joker is a deeply political movie, but it isn't one interested in only giving lip service to one possible perspective. I think a lot of people are going to be coming out of this movie not sure whether the titular Joker was a hero or a villain. Which speaks not only to how much audiences have been trained to see clear-cut moral rights and wrongs in their storytelling as of late, but a deliberate effort on the part of the filmmakers to leave viewers questioning where their own line of acceptability is drawn. With that said, I also don't think there was the desire to leave viewers apathetic about this, to come away going, well I guess you can't say who's right or wrong for sure, oh well, you're low. I feel like it's impossible to be really engaging with the material here and come away shrugging your shoulders about it. It invites real conversation, and that's what I'm going to be trying to do today by providing my take and hopefully fueling something more constructive than the usual fabricated two sides bickering each other. The second thing I want to get out of the way is what I mean when I say this was not the movie we deserved, even if it was the one we needed. Because for the most part, this is going to be a surprisingly positive video for me considering how critical I usually am of the political messaging in Big Hollywood Fair. So, to be clear, I think Joker does a tremendous job of illustrating very contemporary anxieties about class divide and marginalization in our current society, and I'm gonna get into why in a second. But I do think it missed the mark pretty profoundly on aspects of marginalization that can't really be ignored if we're talking about somewhere like the USA, especially taking into account the film's period setting. Namely, 
This film does almost nothing with the clear racial and sexual aspects of how marginalization has played out over the last few decades. And in some ways, I think it even opens itself up to some very dismissive perspectives on things like the ways black and Latino communities have clearly been the primary victims of overt systemic oppression. Overwhelmingly, these are groups that suffer most from many of the things this film has to talk about. Poor education services, poor social care, job insecurity, and as we're increasingly finding out, pollution and negative health defects at the hands of big industry. On top of hindrances like racial profiling and housing discrimination. For all the film has to say about how the working class and mentally ill are treated, these groups are boiled down to token representation in the form of cardboard cutout characters serving mainly as hindrances to the white male lead. Now, for sure, you can respond by saying that this is kind of inevitable when you're making a movie focused on the Joker, and the Joker is obviously going to be a white guy, until the SJWs get their way. And to that I say, absolutely. Which is why for me it's a somewhat minor criticism among most of what I have to say. Still, when a kind of unified uprising against an oppressive system is the focus of your story, I definitely wish more of an effort to acknowledge this stuff had been made. There's only so far a conversation can go when you're ignoring half of it, and frankly I think that's a problem Joker 100% falls into. Okay, now, fair warning, I'm about to gush. The gushing is about to happen. Are you ready for the gush? Here it is. So Joker is, obviously, not nearly the first movie to deal with issues of poverty, mental illness, oppression, or marginalization. Yes, I have seen The King of Comedy and Taxi Driver, and you should also, as well as everything Ken Loach has ever made, everything Spike Lee has ever made, everything Andrea Arnold ever made, Sling Blade, Winter's Bone, Precious Girlhood, Moonlight, and Tangerine, but not The Florida Project. I have some bones to pick with that one. Also, maybe check out some Gaspar Noé films, but uh, try and do it on an empty stomach. I think there's a huge amount of perspective missing from anyone suggesting Joker is something totally new, when even among flashy, stylized US dramas about class divide and violent protest, Last year we got the absolutely incredible Sorry to Bother You. Once again worth recognising so many of the films I just listed both star non-white and non-male main characters and were given far less investment and publicity than Joker, and that probably isn't a coincidence. But the point is Joker is doing incredibly well both critically and commercially, and I think that's a big part of why it's worth talking about. The message of Joker appears to be very much coming through even among people who generally avoid stories with this kind of focus. But what is that focus? Okay, so, brief summary. Spoilers. Joker 2019 tells the story of Arthur Fleck, a clown for hire and failing stand-up, struggling not only with extreme poverty in a rundown Gotham City, but also severe mental illness, resulting among other things in an inability for art to recognize basic social cues, and a pronounced tick forcing him to laugh in inappropriate and uncomfortable situations. Taking cues from the now-famous Killing Joke story from which the movie is mostly based, we then track Arthur as he goes through one bad day, or in his case, one bad week or so. First some kids steal his sign and beat him up, then he gets fired from his job for bringing a gun to work, his mother gets sick, he's openly mocked by his childhood idol after a particularly bad stand-up set goes the 80s equivalent of viral, lack of state funding means he loses access to any kind of social care or medication for his various disorders, and with his mother's eventual death, Arthur completely loses his grip on reality as he embraces the violent alternate persona of Joker. Or at least, I think it would be easy to say this is Arthur losing his grip on reality. The question ultimately posed by the film is, could we really imagine any outcome other than this if we do factor in the reality Arthur lives in? Which brings us to my first point of praise, framing. A common pattern when we look at many big Hollywood genre movies, especially superhero films, is a focus very much on society as being made up of individuals, who appear to make the world a better place or to make it a worse one. It's a classic framework. We have the hero, who we can put all of our hopes and dreams into, and then there's the villain, who represents a disruption of the status quo, and who needs to be defeated to restore order. Watch any Avengers movie, you see what I mean. 
And this is a pattern that repeats in a lot of fiction like this. Sometimes this bad individual will at least represent ideas meaningful to the main character. Lex in Batman v Superman might represent powerlessness. Obadiah Stane in Iron Man 1 might represent greed. Ego in Guardians of the Galaxy 2 might represent... Ego. Joker in The Dark Knight represents chaos. In this way, he probably lines up closer with the Killing Joke incarnation than the one we ended up with here. As a villain, if again we could call Arthur a villain, the one we get this time lines up with a second run of villains who don't just represent abstract ideas, but specific contemporary issues in our society. Killmonger in Black Panther is one of the most obvious examples, written to represent broadly the disenfranchised minorities in the wake of colonialism, more specifically the black community in the USA. And then there's Spider-Man Homecoming, frankly the closest thing the MCU had to real acknowledgement of the growing class divide in much of the world, with Vulture being a blue collar worker forced into a life of crime to support his struggling family. Sadly, Parker himself doesn't contribute much to that conversation, unlike basically every other iteration of the character, usually seen as the working class hero compared to figures like Bruce Wayne and Tony Stark, here he is the pet project of a doting billionaire, and will remain so for the foreseeable future. But that's not the point here. What I want to highlight with these examples isn't just what these movies tend to talk about, but the way they talk about them. Namely that, with rare exception, any time a social issue is introduced in these movies, it's framed in the context of a villain who might have a point, but is still fundamentally wrong. Vulture might have a point that the rich exploit and quickly discard the poor, but he's a criminal who kills people and threatens teenagers and steals. He's wrong and needs to go to jail. Killmonger has a very good point about the indifference towards atoning for our histories of colonization, but he, uh, yeah, he also kills people, and he wants to kill all their children too. Ideas are boiled down to individuals, who can then be quickly discarded so we never really have to consider how broken elements of our society really are. For more on that, check out my video on ideology in the MCU. But then, there's Arthur Fleck. Now, Arthur Fleck does do terrible things in this film. He kills first in self-defense, but after that point commits murder more and more freely, even suffocating his own mother in a moment of bitter revenge, all of this culminating in the brutal shooting of a talk show host in front of a live studio audience. These are horrific acts, and it'd be hard to empathise with any real world person who acted in this way. But here's where the penny drops, and the question left by the film that made me realise how much I enjoyed it. Even if we agree that much of what Arthur does is wrong, can we truly blame him for his actions, given the world that he lives in? Even more pressingly, can we not in some ways justify his hatred? Arthur Fleck is extremely poor and severely mentally ill, two groups usually the first to suffer when social support fails a community. When, say, a conservative government talks about austerity, talks about a reduction in public spending to reduce budget deficits, these are the groups they are knowingly harming, as indeed they do here. Even his mental illness is to some extent alluded to as being rooted in the same lack of support, with the revelation of his adoption and years of abuse before being discovered by social services. This is if we ignore the even darker possibility that Arthur was actually the disowned child of corporate mogul Thomas Wayne, here framed not as the angelic father figure he's usually seen as, but just another indifferent multimillionaire, spouting tired rhetoric about how he's here to save everyone, all the while chastising them for protesting the reality of their social conditions. Arthur Fleck, for all he supposedly loses his grip on reality, in some ways simply sees things for what they are. He sees a marginalised public being constantly mocked and derided by a privileged elite with no real knowledge or care of the life he's had to struggle with. And he says, fuck you, no more. And against all odds, the public picks up that message, fuck you, no more. And the film smartly does the thing these types of movies rarely do, it lets that idea fester. We don't get a Batman showing up to calmly moralise how he understands Joker's frustrations, but can't endorse his violent methods. 
to take him down and throw him in jail to restore order for another day. The film essentially presents us with an idea that if this is the material reality of the world we live in, this outcome of violent, desperate protest is the only one that makes sense. And, well, this is the material reality of the world we live in. At the climax of the film, Arthur himself pointedly claims that he believes in nothing, and I think that's important here. I think if Arthur were framed as a more straightforward revolutionary ideologue, more of a killmonger figure, it would risk conflating his nihilistic bloodshed with the 99% style resistance protest movements the film is clearly nodding to with its conclusion. At the end of the day, Arthur is what you might call pure ideology, a man so consumed by the feeling that the system will not give him a voice to change the reality of his condition that he resigns himself to the small victories. The ability to put a face to every privileged asshole who told him he was nothing more than a punchline and to pull the trigger. This is the actual outcome of the individualistic rhetoric I talk about in these types of media, in which we desperately try to play along with the fantasy that there's one bad figure representing all the ills of the world who we just have to put a stop to, to end the problem. And Joker 2019 says, no. Actually, these problems are the result of a series of much more wide-reaching, interconnected systems. The result of a class system upheld by a state, most of the time upheld by corporate interests. It's a simple equation. If you take these communities, and you remove the systems in place to care for them, and you remove any real ability for them to change that, or in many cases, care for themselves, this is the result. And frankly, yeah. I think we really need that right now. And it gives me hope that a film that acknowledges all of this is currently doing absurd numbers all around the world. Here we have a multi-million dollar project that doesn't cast a moral judgement on violent revolt against a broken system, that doesn't say, maybe you have a point, but you went too far. And by the same token, it doesn't spell out, this is good, it's a good thing this is happening, because, frankly, we know that it isn't. Nobody out there protesting right now wants to be fighting to for now out on the streets for their rights. People who just want to wreck shit and cause chaos are a slim minority against a population that simply wants to be listened to and treated fairly. It's a film that's willing to stand up and say that this is, like it or not, the predictable outcome of what the powers that be choose to do with its people. And I don't care if you're coming at this as someone who already believes all the same things I do. Hell, maybe you usually find yourself in political opposition to me more often than not. I just feel like if there's anything that's going to get us all to realise that we're all kind of fighting the same enemy here, it's going to be stories like this one. Stories that don't seek to police the line between justified and unjustified acts of protest, but simply say, this is our world, here are its outcomes. What could we do together to change that? And sure, that could be naive. There will, after all, always be people like Thomas Wayne or De Niro's Murray Franklin, insisting that despite all we know about Arthur and the society he's living in, he should have just worked harder or made different choices as an individual. People who want to ignore how these are predictable outcomes of marginalization like we see in the film. People who, as Arthur says, won't get it. But who knows? Maybe just once we can basically agree things need to change rapidly, and fundamentally, if we have any hope of making it out of this thing alive. Now, a few things I want to touch on before I go. One, once again, I think it's evident that this film doesn't give us a transparent, correct interpretation of what it has to say. This is my reading, and I've read many others that differ pretty fundamentally to it. I've seen some argue the film, quite contrary to my pro-revolutionary read, has a deeply conservative bent. It does, after all, kind of conflate anti-fascist movements with literally the most famous supervillain in the world. And yes, to anyone who says the film kind of plays into the trope of demonising the mentally ill, I definitely see where you're coming from. I do think the film really goes out of its way to underline that Arthur could have been a perfectly functioning member of society, 
had he not been so relentlessly shat on by the systems in place that were supposed to protect him. But at the end of the day, he is still yet another severely mentally ill man committing random acts of ultraviolence, when we know full well that the overwhelming majority of these kinds of attackers have no history of ill mental health. Finally, I want to acknowledge again, yes, I think the film drops the ball drastically when it comes to acknowledging the other intersections of oppression that clearly play a role, especially if we're talking about the USA. I think it's sad to imagine that maybe part of why the film has succeeded is because of its reticence to acknowledge things are more complicated than class. In any case, I do hope that if you've stuck around through this, you hear where I'm coming from, and even if you disagree with my reading, which I'm very much prepared for, we can have a sincere conversation about it in the comments here and elsewhere. I don't know, worth a shot, right? If you liked the video, please consider giving it a like and maybe even subscribing to hear more perspectives like this one. Use the bell button to be notified of new videos. If you really like my work, feel free to throw me a few bucks over on Patreon so you can be one of the names scrolling by now, or through coffee for one-time donations. It helps me keep the channel going. Finally, consider sharing this on places like Reddit, Twitter, or your local Discord server so we can spread this discussion as far as possible. Other than that, you can also reach me on Twitter at Lacking Saint, and I also stream regularly at twitch.tv slash Lacksaint. You can also check out The Surfs, my channel recommendation for this video. They do great political streams over on Twitch at twitch.tv slash TheSurfsTV, as well as fun YouTube videos which I'll be linking to in the description. A final thank you to our sponsors today for supporting this video. Remember to use the links below to help out the channel, and I guess I'll catch you next time. As always, love you all, and stay safe.